just the energy in the stadium, the rivalry that was built up, and just thinking, man, I want, I want to be a part mm. of this. I soaked it all in and I, and I loved it. I loved it because I think that's what derbies are all about. I'm hoping to one day wear the Australian jersey. I still get goosebumps to this day, you know, and, and, and I started crying when it, when, when it happened. And, and it just felt like the timing was, it, it was meant to be. And it's all about bettering myself. Every day I'm going out there to do the best that I can, improve myself. I'm, I'm going to drive to be, to, you know, until I get there. Bang, welcome back to the number one podcast in the world. Thank you guys for smashing the subscribe button. It goes a long way in helping the channel. Enough of that. I'm joined here today with the former Sydney FC captain, one of the A-League's highest goal scorers of all time and Sydney FC's most capped player of all time. His resume speaks for itself. It's an honour to have you here, Alex. Thank you very much for joining me. No problem, mate. Thanks for having me on. It's, um, it's an... Real honour to get to sit down and speak to you as an avid football fan of myself and someone who's played the game for so many years and been a fan of the sport for even longer. It's um, always great to see someone, especially someone local, who actually made it to um, very significant heights in their career. No, look, and for me, uh, um, you know, the, the feeling sort of mutual. I love doing stuff like this and um, sort of getting to uh, on, on a few podcasts I've done with my cousin. They do more like an EPL chat and... And, in, you know, they, they have the A-League on there as well, and I've been on with them. Um, so, look, for me, talking football, talking life, talking just all things uh, is, is quite enjoyable for me. So It just comes me. naturally for you, right? Look, pretty much, yeah. I mean, it's obviously something now a bit more older and experienced. I'm, I'm finding it a lot more easier and comfortable to do. But uh, something I realised in just, you know, sharing what sort of seemed normal throughout my playing days and, and career um, – you know, people like to hear about sometimes and it might seem like not a big deal to me, but to other people, they seem to like to listen sometimes. So uh, a lot more comfortable doing this sort of stuff now. Yeah, yeah it's awesome. And I've seen you on um, on a lot of networks and stuff discussing and analysing games as well and giving a lot of your breakdown. I've seen you on the news before, like in the pre-game um, kind of press, if you will. Um, so, you know, it's awesome to see that you've made that transition out of a player and out of someone who's been obviously very involved and very immersed in the sport to someone who's able to analyze it and able to break it down for the people at home who might not be as well versed. Yeah, and even just take a, uh, I guess you spoke about the transition there. That's often the hardest part in, um, you know, for players, anyone who's done anything, um, you know, from a sporting career or entertainment career, it's sort of leaving that behind and moving on to something else. And I, look, I, I do feel like I've been quite lucky with the whole, the whole journey, um, you know, I had things put in place, which comes from, I guess, education and educate, you know, the league does well to educate players on on how to prepare for life after football. But at the end of the day, um, you know, the day you stop playing to then start living what, what's a normal life, I guess, um, can be quite confronting sometimes and, and a little bit difficult in, in adjusting and, and coming to terms with. But um, look, I've transitioned quite comfortably and I'm enjoying my time at home with the family and getting to do things that I don't, you know, wouldn't have normally been able to do. Um, and like I said, just time with the family, doing all that and, and while still staying involved with the game, you know, if, in, in a media type of um, role where I'm, I'm getting to analyse and, and break down the games, um, you know, hopefully doing a little bit more around that. I think, um, you know, the league itself and, and the network can be doing a lot more to bring a bit more um, analysis to the game and for... I guess your hardcore football followers, the ones that have been there from the beginning, yeah. um, there's probably a lot more detail that they want to hear rather than us just as former players being there on a couch talking, you know. So, um, look, I feel there's a lot more that I could be doing, but, um, yeah, that all comes in time, I guess. Yeah, of course. I don't want to deviate too far into the media stuff yet because I'm very interested in your career and kind of the um, – the arc that you went through. So you're Western Sydney local, born and raised here. Um, your parents migrated from Uruguay, correct? That's right, yep. So we're essentially brothers in one way or another. <laughs> it's a small country, I'm sure. It's a very I'm small sure country. Um, so how did, what was your first exposure to football? Like how did you first get break into the sport? Um, look, for me, so my old man, he used to play and, it, and, and it's that simple, right? Um, any South American kid, you 
don't really have much of a choice. It's football or, or nothing else. So my dad being Uruguayan and playing, I remember growing up as a young kid and, and um, you know, going to his games and watching him play. So it's it's that simple for me. That's all I ever wanted to do. You mm. know, I wanted to run out and do what he did on a football field. Um, you know, was probably, he a striker as well? He wasn't. So probably a few less yellow and red cards than what he got. <laughs> I, I guess, um, you know, while I enjoyed watching him play, uh, you know, the South Americans – Back in that day, uh, were a lot more aggressive than um, than today. And look, it, it was great to watch. You know, I loved the atmosphere that those games generated. You know, and mm. um, just wanted to be out there on the field. So naturally, as soon as I was old enough, um, you know, the old man got me a pair of boots, and and my footballing journey be, uh, began. And and I sort of never looked back. It was something that I always, as a young kid, um, dreamed. Again, not that I'd play at the you know, in your Premier Leagues or in a World Cup or anything like that. I mean, that's a dream for any kid, right? Yeah. But for me, um, just getting to play football for as long as I could and enjoy it for as long as I could, that was, um, you know, that was the the aim. You don't think too far into the future as a young kid. You just think, how good is this? You know, I get to yeah. run around and play with my mates every day. Um, and that's all I ever wanted to do. So, you know, I was lucky enough to be able to sort of take that a bit further do it professionally, call it a job, you know, and and do it until the day um, that I'd had enough. Do you think there was a point in those early days that shifted for you where you went, oh, actually, I'm good at this and I'm finding a lot of success. Let's see how far we can push it. Look, that that thought process didn't come in until a lot later on, and I'm talking probably my mid to late teens. Um, As a young kid, um, growing up and playing – you know, for Fairfield Athletics, it was a local South American Uruguayan club um, out at Tyrone Park in Bosley Park. I mean, I, I most of the team was was Uruguayan, right? So mm. I had a, a good group of mates and it, it didn't end there. You know, after trainings, after games on the weekends, we'd go and spend time with the families, um, you know, and, and it became a, a close bond of families that is still there to this day. So initially it was just about being around friends and playing a game that I loved, you know, not, it didn't get better than that. And then as I progressed, that's where the, um, that competitiveness and I guess you start going through the rep football and, and that starts to come into play. Um, you know, so I went into the Southern Districts and Marconi Junior set up when I was um, in under 12s. Um, and again, just a good group of guys. It was something. So I went away from that local South American team that I was in. We all each sort of went our separate paths um, because of that rep rep stage. And I met another group of boys that um, you know I went and played the next sort of four or five years with a core group of us at Southern Districts. Um, and again, I, I went as a young kid to a, a bit of an older kid, just loving the game, playing with a group of friends and, and um, you know, I couldn't think of, of doing anything better. So it wasn't until my late teens that I, I had a real good season in the, um, you know, the under-16s actually. I had a really good year that year, scored a lot of goals um, and the, the progression from there was to go into the Marconi um, Colts team, which was like their under-17s that played in the National Youth League, which was, you know, sat underneath the, uh, the NSL back in those days and and I got picked to to play in that team had a really strong season there as well and then went to the AIS so it sort of just happened really quickly Um, and it was at that point you know that 16 17 years of age that I realized that I could potentially make a career out of something and um, you know turn my focus at that point into doing everything I could to to you know, be a professional footballer. And what did everything you could look like? Like, what was your day to day at that age? Um, look, to be honest, again with the with the NSL um, and before going to the AIS, because that that was where I learnt what being a professional footballer was all about. That yeah. was training every day, every day, sometimes twice a day, gym sessions throughout the week as well, and then playing on weekends. That the AIS really. Um, showed me what it felt like to be a professional footballer, and I loved every minute that I spent there. Uh, spent there, but sort of step back uh, playing in the uh, in the Colts at Marconi. Um, I think it was at that point just playing against men, you know. Um, mm. So we we weren't just playing against the seventeens and the under twenties from every club in the NSL. You had first graders dropping down, so you were you know you were putting yourself up against against men and guys that were playing professionally already as a sixteen year old kid. So. Um, I think it was in realising, right, I, I know what it takes to, 
to have to be there, it, it just meant a lot more like eating properly. It meant sacrificing a lot of things while some of my mates were out, you know, going to parties. Um, you know, I had a game the next day, so I had to stay home and rest and eat properly and uh, make sure I was getting enough sleep. And Were making those decisions easy for you? Like, was it, was it easy for you to go, oh, I don't want to go to that party at Sandra's tonight because I'm going to be playing tomorrow? Or was there a bit more of an emotional kind of like, ah, oh, shit, my friends are going, I want to be there? Look, it, it, um, I think I, I was, again, pretty lucky in that because even the school that I went to, um, you know, Westfield's High School, it was a sports school, and I went there. And so, so the group of mates that I hung around with all had we all had the same way of thinking we all played football we all mm. knew that on weekends you know you had to you had to rest you had to be ready to yeah. play on the weekend so look I do think I'm quite lucky in that respect where I I was always surrounded by people who had you know similar interests to me so you know while there may have been school parties and whatever it wasn't just me missing out it was it was all of us you know mm. and then as I got older same thing the, the group of mates that um you know I became close with were playing football so, look, I, I do find, and, and I do know a lot of mates that, you know, outside of football and outside of school, uh, their friends weren't playing football. So they were, I guess, in that path of um, a, a lot more, where they had a lot more of that temptation to go out and to do different things that I didn't really have, you know. So I do, um, you know, I do consider myself quite lucky. I could easily have sort of been strayed if I had a different group of friends or, yeah. or different interests, but... You know, I I, I'm, I was quite lucky in that in that regard. Yeah, and I think that's um, particularly in Australian football and the system that was in play now, but also the one at the time. That's probably one of the biggest challenges a lot of athletes face because, um, in Europe or in Asia or in South America, the football culture is a lot more involved like you literally leave school go to training for three hours every single day and you're around the same group of people all the time and there's physios and there's um and there's head coaches and there's a lot more competition because in an under 16s group there's 30 people trying to get into that one team as opposed to 18 and i think that culture of really keeping kids disciplined from a very young age at 13 onwards because it is so competitive and it is so intense is um really what we're seeing develops players like Messi, develops players like Neymar, you know, develops world talent all across the world. And I think as far as we've come as – a footballing nation where it isn't necessarily the primary sport, it doesn't get the publicity that it deserves and it's still very young. Um, I think that's those steps to in that direction have been extremely helpful. Look, I think so. And I think you're right. I think it, it it's difficult even to sort of compare when you look in South America and, and even watching the, uh, the documentary on Tevez and seeing what he sort of came from to be the, the player that he was. It's, it's a different way of thinking and it's hard because here we're, we're so fortunate in how good this country is and how good um, a life you can have, you know, there, there's not as much poverty and, and that need to use football uh, as a way out, as a way of providing for your family. We don't have that here, right? You can do anything in this country and, and be successful. So um, that's hard but in, even in, in that, see, I feel like with the kids coming through, that that hunger and that desperation um, that you see on a football field from players in Europe and South America because of that compared to here in Australia, that's something we'll never have and something yeah. you can't teach into a kid, you know. So I feel like they naturally already overseas have that competitive advantage mm. over us. So for us, um, you're right, it sort of just becomes a an education piece for young kids where, you know, around, you know, if you want to be play professionally at this level, this is what it takes. This is the road you need to follow, and this is the path that you sort of need to need to travel um, as a young kid, making those sacrifices. So, whereas overseas, it just comes naturally to them. They yeah. know how easily you can get strayed, um, and, and that dedication, that focus on the ones that progress and go through, is, is just so intense. Whereas here, and it's it, it doesn't happen. Such a double edged blade, right? Because you don't want people to have to struggle. You don't want people to go through hardship. You don't want people to be depending on football for the next meal. Um, no one wants that, especially for their own kids or for their friends. But 
at the same time, that's the circumstances in which you do produce the best in the world. That's exactly right. Exactly right. I don't even have a comment to follow that up. I mean, it's it's perfectly said. You don't want it, it is a double edged sword. You don't want you don't want that side of it that creates that that hunger and that fire and, and desire to be a professional. But it's almost what it takes sometimes. So how do you how do you then get that out of players? How do you? Um, it's something you can't teach. It is. Yeah. So we have to find other ways to get you know a competitive edge. I think. When did you get your first professional contract? Um, so it came it came from the AIS. I was at the Australian Institute of Sport when I was seventeen, um, and because I'd left Marconi as a as a you know uh, in the in the Colts team, um, there was that connection there already, and the club was going through a, a bit of a transition um, stage itself, where Marconi up until that point had always been a, a, a big club, big spending club. Um, they slashed the budget. Lee Sperry was basically, who, who was the coach at the time, was given X amount of dollars to come up with a football team and, and do what he could. So he had to bring in a lot of young players, which um, which he did, thankfully for me. You know, he um, you know he came to the AIS, he met with me and spoke to me about his idea, what he was doing, the fact that he had plans for me to, to um, be playing in that first team, which obviously as a young kid I, I liked the sound of and wanted to be a part of. Um, and for me, going back to my local club, which you know I grew up only two minutes uh, two minutes down the road from, it was uh, you know hugely appealing for me to go back to that club. I had offers from a couple other clubs to to join them, uh, Northern Spirit at the time, Perth Glory at the time. But um, you know, in looking to my future and what was the best thing for me, definitely Marconi was was where I wanted to be. Um, How did you feel like once that contract was right in front of you and you put pen to paper? What was that moment like? Um, it's funny because I've got a nephew now who's sort of approaching that stage, you know, and it's um, even even down to him just getting an agent. You know, I remember those moments. And for me now in talking to him, it, it's pretty funny how it just sort of doesn't seem like a big deal to me. But in having a, a conversation with the agent and with him, I realised how big this moment was for him and I took a quick photo of it. Like I, did, I got caught up in the moment initially but then realised, man, this is massive for him. So I yeah. took a photo of it, screenshot it and I'll send it to him one day. But um, I do remember that time as just thinking, you know, everything you've sort of done up until this point sort of is leading, has, has led to this and, and so much can happen from here, right? Like it doesn't mean that in signing with an agent, it doesn't mean we're signing your first professional contract and I've seen it in my career – it doesn't mean that's it, you've made it and all of a sudden everything is going to progress from here. But it's such a good moment to know that everything you have done to that point and all um, you know, all those games of football, all those training sessions has, has, um, has come to this moment and you're actually now about to potentially become a professional footballer, which is all you've ever wanted to do. So it was, it was special, yeah, and something that at the time you don't really realise, but looking back on it is a nice moment. Yeah. It's so easy to just get swept up in the momentum of it. And, you know, as someone who didn't get the opportunity to play professionally but desired it so much, like we always dream of that moment of like being able to do it. And so when you find, especially people that are local and it helps if they're Uruguayan, but find people that have found that success and have been able to cross that threshold into a professional footballer, it's – it. it there's so much pride that comes with that because it's like almost like we're living through you mm -hmm. and it's, it's so impactful, but especially for young footballers, man, like that, it means so much to them. Um, so obviously you went on to have a very successful career in the A-League and you, um, you've gone and progressed and made yourself a real household name especially for football fans. Are there any moments of that career that really – stand out to you i mean you've won so many titles and you've won so many a leagues and so many premierships but are there any specific goals or specific highlights that you look at and go wow i did that look there's there's a lot of um sort of moments like that when you mention sort of trophies and and um and goals and things like that and and, and that's probably the easy part to go into i can talk a bit about about those moments and they're great don't get me wrong looking back that's all you, you have when you finish playing, you know, are those memories and the photos and the videos of seeing all that and realising um, just how good those moments were. But I think equally as, as great is just the fact that, like, like I mentioned before, it was all I ever wanted to do, play football for as long as I could, 
uh, the fact that I was able to do it as a job um, was incredible. But the fact that at the end of the day, once I'd had enough, I was able to sort of call time on, on it when I felt was right. That's the part that I look back on and think it, the, the average career of a, of a football player is only a couple of years, you know. So the fact that I was able to play professionally for, you know, 17, 18 years, um, travel the world, you know, do as much as I did as a footballer for as long as I did and then get to the point where I'd had enough and say, look, uh, I feel like now's the right time um, to retire. I, I feel like that's um, uh, probably the, the best part about it, you know. I think um, all those other things are special and, 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 and bonuses, but just having been able to play professionally for as long as I did um, and experience as much as I did, meet the people I did, have the friends that I still have, um, you know, because of football and everything that football gave me, that's the part that I'm incredibly grateful for more than more than anything else. Um, That's really interesting, the ability to just put a bow on it and be like, you know, we're done. Like, we've done it. That's right. And that's the part, again, where I, like, I realised um, in that last year, like, I, I had a lot of conversations with a lot of people, former players, family, friends on, you know, retiring and whether the time was right. And it felt like it was physically, mentally. Um, it just felt like it was the right time and I had the, in those conversations a lot of people saying look just play as long as you can because once once you stop it's it's all over right mm -hmm. you know and you don't get that back and, and I understood that but I also understood the, the physical and mental toll that it had taken on me and just the fact that I did feel the timing was right and just that not everybody gets that opportunity you know be it through you know injury or form or bad luck um, not everybody gets to get to that point where they decide on their own when they want to stop playing. So you're right, putting a bow on, on the whole career and just saying, look, I got to play as long as I could and called it a day when I was ready. Um, you know, that's the part I feel most privileged and, and fortunate about. Yeah, I think, you know, for a lot of the Sydney FC fans and a lot of the people that have admired you for so long, it's a, it's a very bitter pill to swallow. Like you love seeing people leave the sport in a very – healthy and strong way and not go out because of injury or anything like that but if there's anyone that is happy that you are retired it's probably western sydney wanderers <laughs> they're probably cheering um, i mean you've caused and i i want to come out i want to um be fully honest with you i've been in the rbb more times than i can count <laughs> um it's always been hard when you've scored against us it's always hurt a little bit but at the same time i'm like <sighs> But is the Western Sydney one from Uruguay? I mean, ah, oh, <laughs> you just have to accept it. You're like, yeah. So how how do you find competing in those games, particularly the derbies, right? Because the derbies, when you've got you know true Western Sydney Wanderers hurling abuse and screaming and playing drums and lighting flares, I mean, how do you prepare yourself mentally to com compete against that? Um, look, those those games and weeks leading up to it, they were. Um and they were they were the they were something special. I, I find it hard to um, you know when I look at, at the games now and try and you know put myself in the shoes of anybody else. I, I feel so fortunate that I was able to experience those games in the way that I that I did. Being and growing up and living to this day in Western Sydney, all my family, a lot of my friends from out here. Um, so really getting to feel what and, and knowing what it means to the people from Western Sydney, right, to have a team and to have, um, especially in those early days, a team that really um, was was moulded and, and projected what people felt out here, you know. Um, and seeing that, like I said, the early couple of days, um, the, the first couple of years of the derby, I wasn't around. I was in um, overseas at the time and watching it and I could see it, I could feel it and it was great, you know, that just the energy in the stadium – the rivalry that was built up and just thinking, man, I want, I want to be a part mm. of this one day and I hope I can. So to then come in and experience it, but then also feel that tension, you know, from people out in the West. And I remember um, one of the games that we played, I'd just come off a, a hamstring injury and I was on the bench for the game out in ANZ where it was like 60,000 people and I went like, – it was one thing I said to Arnie, mate – in the, please don't put me on the bench in the 
in the derbies, I don't want to have to go and warm up and cop abuse from everyone <laughs> on the sideline. You know, just the, that's the one game. Everywhere else, I don't mind. But anyway, like I said, coming back from injury, um, you know, I could only play maximum 20 minutes or so. I was uh, at that stage of my recovery. So, and it was the derby, right? Round one, 60,000 people. And I went to warm up and, and I heard all that, right? And I, you know, I had people saying, you know, you're, you're from Western Sydney. How can you be, how can mm. you be wearing a Sydney FC top? And, and in, in different words, obviously, but <laughs> – and you know what? I, I, I soaked it all in and I, and I loved it. I loved it because I think that's what derbies are all about. All right, guys, we need to stop for a second because I want to ask you something. Do you know what the number one regret is for a human being? It's not betting on themselves. It's not taking a chance and it's not chasing that dream that you often see discussed on this show. And do you know what the number one reason as to why people don't do that? It's because of money. But if there's anything I want you to take away from this podcast, it's that you can. You can go and chase your dreams. You can travel the world. You can start the next Fortune 500 company. That's why I'm super excited to announce that I've partnered with Monarch Financial Group. Monarch Financial Group are a team of mortgage brokers who are absolutely committed to making sure you get access to the money that you need and the education that you need. They've got teams of mortgage brokers with over 10 years of industry experience. And that experience goes towards fighting tooth and nail to make sure that you get the best deal possible. So it's time to stop procrastinating on that dream. It's time to go to monarchfinancialgroup.com.au. Make sure to mention Luca's podcast in the process. Yeah, you, know, you need villains. You need heroes, right? So that's what I think the game is possibly missing in the last couple of years. I look at the Wanderers team. I look at the Sydney team. And I don't feel that there's that that genuine sort of um, hate between between the clubs at the moment. You know, it feels like there's no real um, I don't know passion at the moment. And I know it'll come back. I know with Ninkovic, you know, crossing town, I think that's going to add to it again. Yeah. Look, I'll I'll use more words than what probably you can do it but the reality is Western Sydney Wanderers at the moment is just shit. Like we're just not competitive. We just we don't have that same you know, hunger for the yeah. A-League that we once Well, did. everything the club was built on, right? Where you yeah. had your... And someone who's still there at the moment, Labano, Halidi, your Brenton mm. Santa Labs. These guys, I mean, they literally cried for the club and yeah. bled for the club, you yeah. know? And that's what the Wanderers fans wanted to see. They wanted to see people and players going out there and playing for them. Yeah. Know, playing and encompassing everything that they believed and, the, and, and all the work they put these people during the week and then go out there and, and they want to feel that on the field, mm. right? So that's, like I said, before I, I came to be a part of it, being from out here, I know what that's like. I know that feeling. So you're right. That, that's gone in the last few years and hasn't been there, that that passion. Um, and look, I'm sure with Rudin being back there, Eddie Bosner being involved, I'm sure that will come back very quickly. But going back to what it felt and, and being a part of those derbies, so then I had family who gone over to the Wanderers and when I came back, never came back to support. You know, they, they supported me and they said they supported me, but they never came back to support the club and I always, there was that tension as well. So mm. for me, I don't think anybody will experience a derby like I did for that reason, you know. So those games for me were were awesome, you know, and then that connection again with Sydney FC mm. um, and feeling what they felt for me coming back knowing I, I could easily have gone and joined a, a club where where i grew up and i was born but you know put that um pledge that allegiance back to a club that gave me so much and then now it was my turn to give back to them you know and that connection with the sydney fc fans was was incredible you know and um so every derby <coughs> excuse me every derby for me was just such a such an event and so there was so many emotions that went into every single game that um uh, yeah, again, just truly blessed to have been a part and have been able to experience it in, in the way that I did. Where did you feel more pressure, in front of the RBB or in front of the Cove? Um, you know, I didn't feel pressure in front of either. I, I felt the um, the resentment from the Wanderers fans that I was a Western Sydney boy wearing a Sydney FC top. I felt that. Um but also the respect because the fact that I lived here and never had any bad dealings with people, you know, um, at all. It was always, on the contrary, always good and there was always that friendly, um, you know, banter between myself and, and the people out here, even though I, I saw how um, emotional it was between the fans, that never crossed over with me yeah. outside the field, you know. So even though I could feel it, 
on the field, the um, the abuse and the the hatred, it never crossed off the it never it never went off the field, which is something I always respected. Um, and Sydney FC with the fans with them, it, it was nothing but support from the moment that I came and signed at the club. So I never felt any pressure from them. In that first season that I joined Sydney FC, I had a you know, by my own admission, I had a poor season in that first year and there was a lot expected. I was supposed to come in and have a big impact and I didn't. You know, I scored a handful of goals and, and um, you know, didn't do as well as I should have. And again, never felt anything but support from from the Cove, from the, the members. So that's something that, that for me made it always feel like home. The fact that I went out and took the field and never felt pressure from anybody within the, um, within the crowd to have to perform, to have to do well, that they always had my back, you know. So that was... That was good from them. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. I mean, everyone dreams of that moment, just running off into, like, your base of home supporters after scoring a winning goal, especially on the derby. Like, it would have just been such a rush of emotions. Mm -hmm. Is there a come down after a moment like that? Like, is there, like, a all this excitement and entertainment and 60,000 people around me screaming my name and then, like, you're back in the change room again? And That's something, actually, that I've never really... Um been asked funnily enough i mean that 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 side of it right because i look at at um you know watch movies and read autobiographies and then just watch movies of um of you know famous people you know the, the elvis ones not now come out the queen one with freddie mercury and just think man the life that these guys lived and going out to pack stadiums and and i'm, I'm not comparing in any way what you know to, to these guys but even professional footballers right like i watch the premier league every week and think man these guys are just next level, right? Doing that week in, week out. How do they then sort of just switch off? How do they? How do they retire? You know, I, I feel like it was it was comfortable for me, easy for me. You know, um, but forget as well that. And there are so many kids and so many people um, that would love to have been able to play even in a derby. You know, and, and have those experiences. So they might look to me in the same way and 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 have that exact question that you asked and. Look, the, the reality is, I don't know, I've never seen myself on a level of, you know, your movie stars, your rock stars and your Premier League players. I've never seen myself on that level. I've always, I don't know, seen myself as just like anybody else, right? So I don't, um, I, I feel as though in, in thinking and having that mentality, it, it's made it easy for me, right? right. I, don't, I don't, I'm easily able to, um, separate the two and, and I look back and so now when I look back I think man those moments were insane you know scoring that goal going to celebrate and, and hitting the chest in front mm. of the crowd and man they were great moments but then I go back to what I'm doing and just feel normal you know so it, it's a weird weird sort of um, answer that I guess I'm giving I, I never um, I, I almost look at it as two different people you know myself on the field myself off the field and that's probably what has made the transition easy for me, you know, in into just being able to enjoy what it was, see it for what it was, look back on it for what it was, but now be happy doing what I'm doing. But um, so yeah, it's 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 easy for me to look back and those moments um, again, they're, they're sort of just memories that I look back on. And, and the day after a big derby, again that feel and that rush, um, you know, for me was easily. Um, that attention was easily turned just into the family and just realising, you know, I've got kids, I've got a wife, I've got parents, I've got a brother and sister, just like everybody else, you know, so I'm just going to do what I do, what everybody else does, you know, day to day. Mm. Yeah, I think that ability to remain humble and remain really grounded in reality, it's unique for athletes because I think athletes have to remain so competitive and are so dependent mm -hmm. on performance, whereas I think artists or musicians or rappers don't have necessarily that groundwork. It's more because there's physical exercise involved. Yeah, so that's yeah. a big part of why you see a lot more artists or creatives, let's call them, mm -hmm. go into turmoils like alcohol or drugs yeah, yeah. or excessive partying, whereas athletes just have no choice but to remain focused yeah. and then they tend to leave a point in the career where that's not interesting to that's them. That's true. But even so, in going back to the, the discussion we had before about, say, South American <clears throat> upbringing and, and, and that desire and fight and need to come out of a situation to, to provide for the family compared to here... I do also think that in having that mentality um, and, and that, you know, constant drive in being a professional footballer is what separates, say, someone like myself to someone at that next level, mm. you know, because the mental side of the game, 
um, doesn't doesn't get spoken about as much. But you know, I, I never really had that. I was I was you know, I was able to sort of keep the two different, and in not having that drive to succeed and be the absolute best that I could be and want to be overseas and play overseas and play at the best level. You know, those players that probably do struggle afterwards, they have that, you know, and that's mm. why they're so successful. I because see. Because they just have that mentality of it's all football. It's all about bettering myself. Every day I'm going out there to do the best that I can, improve myself. I'm, I'm going to drive to be, to, you know, until I get there, you know, and, they, and they'll do everything to get to that point. Um, and then do find it hard to transition into family and, and go back home and not think about football. So... Again, it's a, it, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a double edged blade. It's a double edged blade. Yeah. Exactly right. So I, again, I feel fortunate, but you know, um, I think the true embodiment of that is Cristiano Ronaldo, right? Like Cristiano Ronaldo is just, and I'm coming more from a um, standpoint of where I really admire Messi. I really mm -hmm. enjoy his football, but I have a huge amount of respect for Ronaldo. And I think everyone in the footballing world can kind of accept like, yeah, what he's doing is incredible. He's 37 years old. He's in tip top shape, still converting goals, obviously hasn't found as much success with Manchester United, but like you admire so much of almost like that illness in his yeah. mind that he yeah. has to be the best. You don't get to that point without being like having a couple screws loose. And I say that as respectfully that's as that's possible. possible. Um, but yeah, I think that's, it's a really interesting thing that you touched on there that it does require this insane amount of obsession to get to those points because just to get to a professional level is extremely hard and extremely competitive. Um, so you've, you've obviously been able to stay and remain, remain very grounded and very humble and um, remain Alex throughout this whole process. How did you find the transition from Australia to the UAE? Because you were playing at Al A and Al Ain, yeah, that's Al Ain, right. Sorry, I couldn't pronounce that. Um, Al Ain, and that's a very big culture shift, mm -hmm. and that's that would have been tough on you, I imagine. Look, well, initially, so I went from um, I, I'd played about five years at Sydney. Um, we'd just come off winning the grand final, and an offer was sort of presented to me and an opportunity to go to Japan first. Um, and I felt the timing was right. You know, like I said, I'd been at the club for a, a number of years i'd sort of finally won a, a championship with a club was in my mid-20s and was sort of looking for uh for that next sort of thing that next step and could i test myself in a you know in a in a league like japan um so i came from there and then i played two seasons in japan um again i mean the the culture shock there f from living in australia to going to a, a country where you know um, especially in the city that i lived in you know, there weren't many foreigners, weren't many people that speak Eng uh, spoke English. Um, and it was difficult initially, but... Especially with the language. Yeah, that's right. But uh, look, I learned so much um, with the culture of Japan and the people of Japan that honestly, it's um, for anyone that can have and, and, and has the opportunity to go and experience it for a couple of weeks, even a couple of months if possible. Look, I... I I strongly advise it. The, the respect and the culture of the Japanese people is like none I've seen anywhere else. You know, it's such an incredible, um, you know, nation of people who go out of their way above and beyond to, to help everybody, help themselves and, and um, an incredible place. And, and their passion then with sport, with football um, was great, you know. So it was, it was an incredible experience going there. Um, look, I was helped again, very fortunate um you know in in moving over there i, I went to a, a team that uh, eddie bosner who's a you know australian player australian football player as well um, he was at the club so he helped me transition into that club our coach was an american um, iranian coach who spoke english so i mean even that was was easy for me in understanding what the coach's um you know game plan was and day-to-day -day dealings with him um it was more just so with the players you know i guess trying to develop that communication and understanding with them and a uh, little bit of banter as well, joking. It's hard to, to have that when you're a foreigner and uh, don't speak a word of Japanese, right? Yeah. That, that was the hard part. But, um, again, the, the players there were incredible. Um, Did you go by yourself? No, I went with my um, with my wife. We were married. Uh, were we married? 
We were married. We had a kid. We, we uh, yeah, we had a kid who was um, less than a year old. Um, so we went over as a family. Yeah, yeah. That's. I think that's tough, so tough. key. I think that's so key. But just having, even if it's a small network, a network of people mm-hmm. that really love and care for you, and want to support you. Because I had a similar. I mean. I wouldn't say similar, but I had a taste of that experience because I went to live in South America for a year and I obviously had a lot more advantages of having a little bit of background in Spanish and having a family around me and not having the impression of an entire professional football club, you know, on you. But I can almost empathize with that experience in that you're going to a brand new country where I imagine the styles of football would have been extremely different. The language is extremely different. The, the, the food, just getting around, catching a bus, like these are things that no one thinks about, but are realities of your day-to-day life that you do have to navigate. That's right. And even, I mean, more so with that family side, right? So the fact that you're taking a, a wife and a young child over in making sure that when you go training, when you go away to play and stay the night in another city, that they're okay, that they feel good, you know. And it's, um, you know, I'm obviously surrounded by my teammates and and whatever and I've got a distraction, but, you know, they're sitting at home on their own and and it's difficult. So as a a player, you've then got to think about that side and there's that um, aspect of it as well that's incredibly, incredibly difficult. But I think if you, you know, that's – I've always been someone where, you know – has relied a lot on family and, and my partner and my kids to to sort of be there for me and um yeah that's that's another side of um being a footballer that's important you need that sort of network uh, and team behind you to be able to go out and be able to perform otherwise you know if you've got the stresses about um you know the wife not being happy or your kids not being happy that can really play on you on the field, you know. So, look, I'm lucky with the support that I had, um, you know, that it was um, able to make things easy for me in playing, you know. But definitely, yeah, those those parts of it are, uh, are hard. And, again, why moving to Japan and just seeing how well the community and the city took to my family and, and to helping us settle and making sure that anything we needed was, um, you know, we had um, was, was incredible. So then... From there, the move to the UAE came, and look, that one was more a financial one when I look back on it, and, and actually providing and setting myself up and my family up for the future. It was a, a decision I had to make between sort of you know going there and and, and also realizing right there's a there's a World Cup around the corner. I'm in Japan. I've gotten myself into the Socceroos fold. You know, I know that if I make a move to the UAE where the league isn't as strong, um, you know, this could this pretty much is, is the end of my national team career and, and, and I'm sacrificing a potential spot at a World Cup. So there was that decision to make um, and look, one that I look back on and, and don't regret at all. You know, I think there were, there were a few players um, at the time, Holger Osik was the, was the coach and then he got, um, he got moved on and, and Ange took over um, and even players who had played right through the qualifying process um, you know, when Ange came in, they missed out on going to the World Cup. So I, when I look back, I, it's, a, it's a situation that I feel completely comfortable in, in having made it and having made the decision, uh, knowing what it did in the end for my family, even though it, you know, I, I wouldn't say cost me a World Cup spot because, like I said, there was still, you know, a lot of months and, and there was no guarantee that in Ange coming in, he was going to pick me to go to the World Cup anyway. Um, you know, but it, it potentially cost me a spot at, at going to a World Cup. Uh, but again, you know, in... Looking back now, years years um, gone since that moment, and and the decision that I made, one that I'm completely comfortable with, and um, you know, one that ultimately sort of set myself up and allowed me to transition, um, you know, out of football a lot easier. So, yeah, no regrets in uh, in my football at all. That was a perfectly summed up answer. It was very well put together. Um, so speaking of the World Cup. And all things. You've had a couple bouts playing internationally. You've done some qualifier games. Um, I imagine that your hopes and dreams of the World Cup winners being Australia, right? Um, look, of course, that, that's the, uh, the goal and hope that one day that does happen. I think realistically, when we look at it, we're nowhere near mm. competing for a World Cup at the moment. Our... our Immediate aim is to... Hypothetically, though, if Uruguay were to play Australia in the World Cup Grand Final, what colour shirt are you wearing? Oh, look, for me, that's... Uh, and I'm happy to sort of go through how I got to this uh, this point, but that's an easy decision for me now, right? I mean, obviously, Australia. Um, 
looking back right now, and again, I'll, I'll tell you sort of how I got to that point. I was at the AIS, um, and um, Australia playing Uruguay at the MCG. So oh. we got tickets, <laughs> and um, and I went with uh, with one of the boys at the AIS. We caught a we caught a, a bus down or a train down. I can't remember. My old man with a few mates. They um, they went down, and we met there. And you know the 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 idea was to go. Obviously, I'm I'm at the yes, mind you. So I'm, I'm supporting Australia. I'm I'm hoping to one day wear the Australian jersey. Um, anyway, so I'm going there, and and I'm there with my dad, who's um, you know somewhat torn, but obviously going more for Uruguay, given given that's uh, where he was born. Um, anyway, so we we found out that the Uruguayan national team was going for a walk the morning of the game, and. Um, you know, people were allowed to go and see them, right? So um, I had a Uruguayan jersey. I've put it on and I've sort of joined all the Uruguayans sort of doing the march and, and going to, to see the players. And that's where, again, you talk about the passion, right, and, and that just insane love for the game. I, I sort of, as I'm walking through and I'm seeing the people and then we finally saw the players and just, you know, people in tears in seeing the players, just in, in the connection the players had with the fans in seeing the support that they had in yeah, the country. We're talking some big names here, like Diego Forlan, yeah. Luis Suarez, Fernando Musleta. Recoba like, at Recoba that time. Recoba at the time. Insane, I mean, right? These Insane. Were I took a photo with him, uh, with uh, Carini, was the goalkeeper actually at the time. Ah, oh, right, okay. Man, so I'm talking back then. Yeah, yeah, 2001. yeah. And just seeing that and what it meant to the Uruguayan people, I remember going to the to the stadium and, and hearing the national anthem and seeing the players sing it, right, mm. and just thinking, man, this it was a weird feeling that I had where I felt like man this means so much more to them than it does to us I, I, we don't we don't deserve to be there right like we shouldn't be taking the spot off people and off a country where this is everything to them you know so funnily enough even though I'm at the IS I found myself happy that Uruguay ended up going to that World Cup um, and I didn't know why, you know, I felt strange. I felt, I'm Australian, I'm born here, I don't, I don't know why I'm feeling that. But, I mean, I did know because I, I, I knew what I felt and what I saw, right? Fast forward four years and we're playing and, and you know, Australia's playing again against Uruguay. Right, I was thinking about this game, the yeah, 2005 right, right. No, one. No, no, no. Yeah. So the one was four years earlier. Four, so four years later, Australia's playing again. And all of a sudden these comments about, you know, from Rakoba, right, saying that it's it's our right as Uruguayans, you know, like Australians, it's not their, you know, this isn't this isn't the be all and end all for them. You know, they've got rugby league, they've got AFL, they've got other sports, cricket. This 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 is it for us. You know, we have a so, right. I'm sorry, could you just keep that down, please? It's almost our right, divine right to be at a World Cup, you know, and I and I sort of thought and where I understood it four years earlier, now I'm thinking and I saw the passion had changed completely in the Australian people, right? So I'm, 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 I'm standing there, Alois is stepping up for this, this penalty and, and my hands are in, in my head. I'm watching from home. I, I was in Brisbane at the time. Um, gave the tickets to my parents to go out and watch the game. And um, the moment it went in, I still get goosebumps to this day, you know, and, and, and I, I, I started crying when it, when, when it happened and it, and it just felt like the timing was... It was meant to be. And, and I'm not a big believer in, in destiny and, and things, you know. Look, I, I do think things sometimes happen for a reason, but it felt like that, you know. It felt like, right, as a, as a footballing nation, we're there. We're now ready to be a part of the world stage and the World Cup, and, and we it is our right now, you mm. know. We do deserve it. Whereas four years earlier, we were so naive still a little bit you know we we came the uruguayan team came out here and we roll the red carpet out and have them staying at the best hotels and everything's fine we go to uruguay and they they make life difficult for us because it's us or them right mm. so we're, we were so naive as a sporting country and we still are in some respects but four years later it, it just felt like and seeing the players even like they'd gone through it four years earlier they knew what it meant to the uruguayan team and what it had to mean to them to then to win that game and, and they did and they did it and they did the country proud and the fans as well, you know, just knowing what it meant for everybody. An incredible, you know, um, 
change in the way in my mentality and 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 from four years earlier to where I was now so now I, I feel like as Australians and as an Australian football culture I, I do feel like we look we've got a long way to go when it comes to supporting and, and being passionate and fans mm. um but at that moment, I felt like, you know, we, we were there. We were ready to, to take that. I think culturally there was a big shift after that qualifier. That's right. That's I right. think there was a real, like it really gave football in Australia the limelight, even just for that split moment that mm. it really deserves. And uh, as members of a footballing com- community, one of the most frustrating things is that it's not, telegra- it's not televised enough. It's not promoted enough. The news stations aren't talking about it enough. And it really just does depend... Although not so much now, especially in those earlier days, it did depend so much on word of mouth mm-hmm. and, you know, just finding streams that would have the games on. And it wasn't always like the way it is now. Um, so you're going to be rooting for Australia if they go up against yeah, of course, Uruguay look, in the World of course. Cup. Even, even leading up to that, ever, ever yeah. since then, it was definitely yeah, yeah. Australia. Yeah. Do you think you'll be going to the next World Cup? Look, I'm not sure. I... Um I had plans to go with family and a group of friends mm. and um, just people started dropping off and it didn't eventuate in the end. But, um, yeah, look, I, I, I don't know. I think it'll be an interesting and unique World Cup in Qatar. Uh, yeah. You know, I don't know. Uh, look, logistically, it's uh, having all those games in the one city. It's um, – look, I hope it's done well and I'm sure that it will. You know, they'll be spending all the money and leaving no stern, uh, stone unturned to, to make sure it is run properly. But – um, I have my doubts, if I'm honest with you. And, and likewise, I feel as though it will be somewhat chaotic, you know, and just, mm. I just don't know. There's so an interesting be- decision by FIFA to go with Qatar, which is, you know, such a small country. Um, well, it was more than interesting. It was, uh, we, we know why they got the yeah. World Cup ultimately. And, and look, whether it was the right decision or not, it was done. And, and um, look, as football fans, we, uh, we we just need to support it now and make sure that it, as a country they make sure it runs smoothly, everything goes well, uh, and the game, you know, is put above everything else because we can't have, you know, we can't afford the game to, to be seen in a, in a poor way and, and for the decision that was made and, the, and all the negative, you know, comments surrounding it to be justified, you know, so we need it to go well. Yeah, look, there's... I think a World Cup's always going to be a World Cup and people are going to tune in and watch. But logistically, because I'm going to Qatar, okay. I'm, I'm actually going to be there. So I've got more of an inside scoop of what's actually going down. And so what the experience has been in for me is that getting the tickets has been fine and getting kind of like approved for visas has been whatever. Like FIFA in that way of taking care of everything. But I just think, I don't know if... Qatar has the infrastructure to really support that many people coming at one time. So at the moment, the real battles for accommodation, mm-hmm. finding accommodation in Qatar is next to impossible. Like I think they said, and I don't know how up to date these statistics are, but I think they said they've got facilities for about a hundred thousand people to be staying there, like excess of their mm-hmm. normal population. And they expect like well over half a million people mm-hmm. to be traveling to Qatar for the world cup. So prices in, you know, just trying to get a hotel or an apartment for a two week stay, let's say, is like well over ten to fifteen grand. Yeah, right. right. And that's just on accommodation. Mm-hmm. So it's becoming like just almost like a bidding war. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and we're that, like yeah. ninety days out and we're still kind of like, oh, yeah, what are we yeah. gonna do? And that's the thing as Australians, I mean, up until only a couple months ago, last month, we didn't know we were even going. So yeah. now and people trying to book flights and accommodation, um look again, it's all a little bit um seems chaotic, but Hopefully it goes well. At yeah, the day we, we, it is the biggest tournament in the world. Um, it needs to be done properly, and and hopefully it does. You know, I think the Socceroos they've got a good base there. They've played so many games out of there that mm. they'll feel comfortable playing there. But that's it. We just need to support the boys now, and um, and hope they do well. And what a dramatic way to qualify as well, <laughs> <laughs> wasn't it? I mean, look, they. I look, I look back on it and think that um, you know Arnie was able to spin all that negativity and all the. Um, Look, I, I wouldn't even call it negativity. I'd just call it honesty and truth, right? I, I know there was a lot of – there was a chip on all the players' shoulders about, you know, the fact that, you know, we didn't uh, – nobody believed in them. You know, nobody gave us a chance. But I feel like that was justified in, in, in the way they qualified through, right? So we had four difficult games in qualifying. Japan twice, Saudi Arabia twice. And we picked up two points from 12. So – there was nothing that they showed us in that qualifying to give us hope against a nation like Peru, right? You're talking about a, a country that's kept Colombia out, kept Chile out. 
top five South American country, um, you're expecting them to be with an explosive well, fan base. Can I just say? Uh, Sorry exactly to cut you right. off. No, there. you're exactly right. Which is why I feel like our our criticisms of the team were were more honest and um, speaking based on what we've seen. Right. So I think Arnie is a master of sort of sw- uh, switching that. And, and, and developing with the playing group that us against the world mentality of look, this is what people are saying back home. Nobody thinks we can do it. You know, let, we're gonna we're gonna show them that we can. You know, and and you can feel that in the players. You know, even though yes, Peru didn't play well, um, Australia still had to stand up and 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 give a good showing of themselves mm. and and be competitive, be hungry, be everything we sort of hadn't really seen in those games against Japan and Saudi, and they were. They stepped up, they qualified, and, and they were incredible in that in that match, right? So Arnie did very, very well to do that. I think now it's just, um, you know, hoping they can do it again and um, some big games. But, you know, I guess we, uh, we've we seen now that the squad has it in them to, to pull off some shock results and do something that no one expects them to do. So, you know... Games against France, Denmark, Tunisia, they're going to be difficult, but that's the World Cup, right? That's the World Cup. You want to be on the world stage, you've got to compete. All right, we're going to um, have to wrap up soon because I know you've got to be out of here, but I just want to shoot you some rapid-fire questions, get some immediate responses. If you have to bet your life savings on who's going to win the next World Cup, who's it going to be? Um, You know, I did like a quick uh, thing my mate got me to do, a predictor on, you know, each game and then how that progresses to the quarters, semis, finals, and I ended up having France winning the World Cup. So Safe bet, safe bet. (laughs) Peñarol or Nacional? Nacional. Oh, you're breaking my heart here. No, again, man, the old man. My old man was a Sydney FC and Nacional. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Is it true that you were in a group chat with Juan Mata, Matt Hummels and Cellini? Um, I am. I, I never uh, pipe in or say anything. It's more to do with the. Uh, uh, it, it's called common goal. So common goal is um, you know the idea that a player pledges one percent of their salary um, towards the common goal and and towards um, you know I guess football charities which end up doing things in the community and putting uh, you know those monies to good use in um, you know in in other ways you know outside of football. So. I am in a group chat, like I said, I've never, and actually have received a, a personal video from Juan Mata thanking me in, in joining the uh, oh wow the group, which is awesome, yeah, but uh, we never chat, we never do anything, so it's nice just being a part of it. Yeah, that would be so cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last one, classic question, Messi or Ronaldo? Oh, see, if you'd asked me a couple of years ago, I would have said, um, I would have said Messi hands down, right? just a freak of a player and, and I do still lean towards Messi but I feel like that move for him to PSG compared to Ronaldo's move to Manchester United that changed the game a little bit for mm. me I feel like just Ronaldo that that constant desire to be at the best and to take everybody with him to that next level and that that drive is incredible you know he's a phenomenal player but you know someone sort of summed it up to me perfect I feel like with Ronaldo Great left foot, great right foot, aerially brilliant, speed, power. His attributes in every quality of a footballer are, are, are phenomenal, right? But those things can be taught. There can be another Ronaldo. I, I don't think there can be another Messi. He's mm. just a freak and, and something. He does things that that are incredibly unique. And one only other player in Maradona were able to do. Those players come along once a generation, and they're and they're incredible. So. I'm still leaning towards Messi, but uh, incredible respect for Ronaldo and, and what he's done. Yeah, I, I think that's beautifully summed up very well. Um, listen, Alex, I want to thank you for joining us today. It's been a pleasure having you, man. Um, any final notes that you want to leave on? Any plugs that you want to put onto the public? Or No, not really, man, not really. Like I said, for me, talking football, talking life is is, uh, is good fun. You know, if uh, this helps anyone in, in any way and, and kids can get uh, any inspiration or, or, or even players still playing, um, then, man, that, that, that's good and, and um, you know, it keeps me happy. So it was a pleasure being on. Thanks for having me on. Anytime, man. All right, thank you, guys, and we will see you next time.